So welcome everyone to this online event on closing well, composting our networks when it's time. And we're gonna be having this session with the help of Luis Armstrong and Sophie Banks, our speakers today that uh, I will introduce to you in just a few minutes. And I'm not here alone. I'm also here with Lena, uh, my co-host and another co-host, Catherine uh, Yega. Let's see if you can make so people see you. So just for you to know, I think I know most of you on the call, but not everyone. So I'm Alicia from the Greater Than Collective. And uh, we are a collective that um, supports other organizations in the self-organizing journey, community building, and we ourselves practice um, all of that, experiment and try to bring it along to others. So this is also part of the experimentation, knowing like how how do you close when you have to? Like how, how do you do that? We have a few stories about that. Hopefully we'll be able to share some of those. So briefly just that we land in together with my co-host. So Lena, over uh, to you, just so you can introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, Alethea. It's great to see you and to see many familiar faces. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, my name is Lena. I'm part of Greater Than. I co-facilitate thriving networks and do a bunch of other things within Greater Than. Amongst that is a retreat facilitation. So I just want to flag that I came out of three and a half days of facilitating and it just ended today, which I think is quite beautiful. Like to feel the, like the ending energy is with me, which also means that the exhaustion energy is with me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's super great to be here and, I might not make it to the end. I hope I will. Um, but if I'm not there at the end, Alethea will be there. And I hope you bear with me. Um, yeah, over to you, Catherine. Hello, everyone. I'm Catherine Yeager and an alum of the one of the Thriving Networks cohorts, which was such an interesting and amazing experience for me. And I've been part of, as I think all of us, just different kinds of networks and some are still survive, but a lot of them crash and burn bluntly. And so I'm really excited to be here today and hear a little bit of wisdom and hopefully a better way to close. And I'm hoping to bring that forward. So back to you, Alicia. Thank you. Yes, we'll share a bit more about the context, why we got into this discussion about this topic in a moment. But before that, we wanted to offer all of us a moment to land in together. So we will do a check-in and grounded experience guided by Lena. So over to you, Lena. Yes, it's uh, definitely not uh, the easiest uh, topic. I find it very emotional is not in the stomach just hearing about it that you know closing composting endings and then i remember from all the experiences this relief once let's say the decision is digested it happened and it's like okay now it's like new energy comes in so that you can actually do the closure um that's uh something i've been experiencing a lot in the past few years and why this topic Apart from uh, that's something I'm, I'm and we are at Great and I'm very interested in, we host a course um, called Thriving Networks that has been mentioned uh, already. And in it, we try to give tools and ways of understanding to networks so that they can sustain themselves in, let's say, non uh, traditional ways, so new ways of understanding value and then how to apply that and different ways of, for example, dealing with, with money, reflecting on the projections that we do with it at an individual and then also at the collective level. And with the alumni, we started doing um, alumni calls. We did one in May. It was our first one. And we just had a discussion, which we we're trying to see what is emerging, like what is there, what have you been dealing with the past few months? We had seen some people um, not for a couple of years. And it seemed that composting closure had been something that many people had been dealing with. And you know, we we're having this conversation. We don't know how to do this in a good way. And then we thought, okay, then that's the perfect topic for us to have a discussion look for some experts that can help us uh, with this topic, give us a bit of the sort of mindset that we need to get into this topic and also some practical tools. And that's what we intend to do today. 
So we will go right away into a discussion with uh, our two uh, speakers. I will introduce them. We will do this in a fishbowl format. I will let you know how this works. So it's 30 minutes first us having a discussion so you can hear about their insights. And then we will, we will open the fishbowl and we will invite all of you to share your experiences. What has worked? What has not? How do you deal with these topics? Um, that's the idea that we co-create these as we don't have all the answers. That's the idea. And then we will go into reflection, breakout, and we will close together. So that's how we intend to spend this time together. Now, let me uh, introduce you to the two speakers that we have. I'm very happy we could uh, coordinate it with two of them, with both. With the, I know they have a very busy agenda, so thank you so much for being here with us. So we have um, Sophie Banks and I mean, very wide and broad uh, career around your therapies of footballer. I read as well in your bio, um, an activist engineer. We also have been working in the past few years with this project that you call Healthy Human Culture, on which I hope that we hear a little bit about today. And then you also base your work on how to express uh, griefs in, in collectives and, and how to deal with it in a healthy way. So welcome, Sophie. Thank, thank you for being with us. And we are looking forward to hear and learn a lot from you. And then we have Louise Armstrong with us as well. Thank you as well, Louise, for being with us. Also, explorer, adventurer, very broad uh, career supporting organizations and all sorts of topics. And uh, what I find very interesting is that uh, you say you are in this 10 year cycle in which you want to contribute now in these 10 years in reframing how we deal with grief, loss, death, I guess, in organizations and beyond as a let's say step needed for transformation which is something that um, i said we really don't know how to do that in in our culture so thank you both for being with us and i just want to guide us all together now to the fishbowl format it's called fishbowl because you will see me louise and sophie in the middle like fish in a fishbowl and then the rest of you will be like let's say around us but we will not see you and then um yeah i'll explain the next steps but that's uh, it comes uh, from the physical spaces when you have a inner circle of people talking and the rest are seated around them and then you can enter the fishbowl physically here we will do it with our camera how are we going to do that so I invite you to, um, not Louise and not Sophie, but um, the rest of us, we shut off our camera and then you hover your mouse over the little, um, let's say, image with your name and three little dots will appear. If you click on those, you will see an option that says hide non-video participants. Let me just share briefly my screen to make sure you know how to do this. Here we go. So you can see it here in my screen. I shut off my camera. Then you see the three little dots and that you only see that in gallery view. So make sure you're at upper right corner of zoom view, gallery view. Then three little dots hover over and then you will see this option hide non-video participants. Yeah, but you can only do that if you hover your mouse over someone who has shut off their camera so let's see amandine and bilal if you manage yeah here we go thank you and sophie and louise maybe you can also do that part of hide non-video participants so that you also see uh, the fishbowl only with us let's see here we go now we have it good so we will have the first few minutes of the conversation with us, listening to your insights. Basically, I have a few questions. Maybe we don't need it and we just flow uh, with what it is that it feels relevant for you to share now. And then we will open the fishbowl and how all of you uh, present here with us can participate is by turning on your camera. But I'll let you know once that moment starts. So first of all, uh, yeah. We, we can start the conversation already. And 
my first question um, to both of you would be, you know, we are in a culture that we know surrounds closure and grief, basically with shame, isolation, lots of stigma and judgment. What's what's wrong? Why is this happening? You can give us a bit of a, an explanation, your understanding of what's going on in the world. Can I start, Louise, or is that okay? I'm gonna swing it straight to you, Sophie. So. <laughs> I feel like I might drop some C's and then you might knit them all together. That's my sort of sense. Um, so there are different little seeds that I want to bring in. Um, one is about from more from the grief tending perspective. So this question is why why are we averse to grief or you know why is modernity you know who is it that's averse to grief but why is it that uh, mainstream culture, dominant culture, um, doesn't have shared spaces for grief in particular. That's been a question that I've been asking. When I suspect that most human cultures throughout time have had some way of coming together and so I don't even really like the word processing. So we, we start to sort of run out of words, but moving through the emotions of what life brings us, which includes joy and celebration often you know we, we have more of a party culture um, but then what about the deaths the injuries the losses the transitions um, the dreams that never happened so all of the different kinds of grief that that life brings us anyway and I'm curious about how much the loss of shared spaces for grief becomes a pervading organizing force in culture. So once we lose our routine and our rhythm and our knowledge of how to hold spaces to move pain through, I think pain becomes something that we create a belief around that we don't know what to do with it. So whether we learn that as children, so things happen to us as children and we're not held to fully recover, to fully move those through our body, um, but I think, you know, we can look out and see the many, many forms of injury that are happening to do with race or gender, to do with poverty, to do with individual things that happen between people, to do with stress in organisations. Like there's so many forms of widespread harm that are happening. And I think that there's a kind of if, if we lift Sometimes I've done this with groups. It's like you start to share something about uh, the pain that we carry, and it's almost like the carpet and, and comes up and you see that underneath the way that people bring themselves into groups, but especially into organisations, there are layers of hurt that we generally hide. You know, not in all cultures or all groups do this, but often... Um, we hide in order to present a persona that says, I'm managing, I'm okay, I'm competent, I'm dealing with the world, um, and we don't bring our vulnerability. And I think, you know, collectively, there is a, once we've lost those shared practices, I think there's a collective belief that we can't meet it, we can't meet collective pain. So then life becomes a question not of how to live fully in a sense of deep trust and connectedness, but how to manage given this condition that when pain arises, we probably can't do anything about it. And a lot of time and energy individually and collectively is spent soothing pain, avoiding pain, distracting from pain, you know, numbing pain, all the ways that we do medicating it, putting food on it, whatever. But the thing that we tend to not do is to create a beautiful space and call in lots of support and turn it into medicine. And that's what I see happening in spaces where we have grief is that actually it becomes a medicine for reweaving connection, reweaving a sense of interdependence that we need each other. Um, yeah, and, and it becomes really a deep form of nourishment. And I is it okay to just put in a couple more seeds and then 
pass to you, Louise, is that all right? Um, so a second question for me is about this word composting and ritual. And I'm really curious, you know, about the process of composting and how much, you know, ritual in its widest sense is part of what helps us to do that. And ritual could be the sitting around together with a group of people at the end of the day and just talking about how your day was, just digesting the experience of the day. You know, but what are the rhythms and the rituals that we have? You know, at the end of the year, do we gather in what's happened? Is there a kind of harvesting or a dreaming? You know, do we have this sense of a, of a period of collecting and, um, yeah, metabolizing what's been happening to us? Um, and then the last bit that I want to speak about, because I think it's particularly relevant to this inquiry, is about organizations. And I feel really curious about the kind of split that is created within us as people by the formation of organizations. And again, this sense that throughout human history, the idea of an organization where you go as a professional, separate to the community that is your family and all of your relations and the people that you eat with and gather food with and live with and share the realities of life and death and survival is such an extraordinary and weird idea. You know, in the context of human history, the concept of an organization is really, really strange. And for me, part of, all, you know, where did organizations come from? I suspect they came out of patriarchal colonial mm -hmm. culture, industrialization. You know, they came out of some quite dysfunctional bits of human history. Is that true? But for me, part of when I've worked in organizations, of what I've noticed is this sense of there's this that I bring to work and the feeling embodied vulnerable self is expected to be left out. And I think that split is really interesting. And then how it is for an organization or part of an organization to move towards processes that in the wider culture we avoid anyway, when actually there's, a, there's this other layer of we don't talk about grief and vulnerability and all the things that that brings so anyway, that's those are some of my seeds from some of the work that i do thank you you've already made me want to go off on a completely different tangent that, that piece now about organizations i kind of like oh we're left with we're organizations are helping us disassociate from ourselves and, and that's really challenging but that wasn't where i was going to start but i'd like to kind of <laughs> go there again um yeah, I think your sort of starting question about why why is it, um, which picks up on what Sophie was saying about pain. I think sometimes we we just don't know what grief and endings are anymore, and our assumptions about them being uh, bad and sad and painful are all true. But while we don't experience them or get curious about them that perception just grows and grows and grows and grows and grows I think it's also we we often associate it with people and people dying which of course is is very much part of it and there's something about our relationship to mortality and and almost sometimes I think we're we're scared and fearful of being intimate with life and so we don't think about that death piece because it confronts us with the very present reality and that's been a really important reframing for, for me and my journey in this slightly weird obsession that I've had um, to see it like that and, and now I'm much more exploring um, yeah I was obsessed with death and now I'm like no I really want to understand what it means to live and to live well and what that means in the kind of moment but I think it's so associated with people that we've forgotten um, that the endings and the grief are on so many different levels of well as well, but we don't always have the language to uh, recognize that, even though that's very much part of life. Like life is about beginnings and endings, but we sort of think about endings in a very binary way. We think about a start and, and an end, but actually it's a process. It is a process of life. And we've sort of um, taken away that, that, that reality of how things are and so therefore we experience it as a binary and a polarity as well not as as kind of part and the same um yeah and I think when done well they can be really beautiful and liberatory and 
that is where the sort of truly transformative work can happen. But I think what often happens is we sort of run away from it just, just as you're about to get to that, that point. But I think anyone who has kind of gone through something really difficult and sometimes multiple years after it, you realise that there was a huge amount of rich learning that, that actually came from it as well. I'm making it sound a bit neater than it is in reality because of course it isn't. But sort of while, while we don't get curious about it, they become much bigger than they are. Um, and some of the work that I've done over the last couple of years is really thinking about what do endings look like in the context of a network that's closing or an organisation that's closing. Um, and with that same thing about endings as a sort of binary, we think about the end, but of course there are, are many steps towards that point as well that, you know, taking a decision, even before you're taking a decision, when you don't even know that that is the decision that's on the cards, and actually that's often the most painful tumultuous process and you said it in the beginning and I said there can be a real relief when when a choice has been made and then uh, you have to commit to it and then you you can if you have time design it and really kind of follow it through uh, so it's not just an end because there's a whole host of things that kind of lead up to that as well um yeah so there's sort of some lessons about about how to do that well that we've learned in a kind of professional setting but ultimately it's going to be how how all those individuals within it as relate to this difficult thing that is less spoken about as well. So that's where a lot of the complexity comes in. Yeah, there's my kind of starting point. Thank you. Uh, you've been pointing um, to, to it, like why should we engage in, in grief and, and closing and without wanting it to sound, let's say utilitaristic, I find it useful to understand, like for example, I, I study emotions in self organizing and usually it's like taken for granted um, or put to the side. But of course, they help us a lot. Engaging with emotions help us with conflict transformation and sense making and all sorts of human processes that we need once we break uh, hierarchies. Uh, in this case, like what is that? How can grief support, as you have mentioned, learning, for example, um, and harvesting? Uh, but what other elements can grief and closure support us with, uh, with networks, organizations? Once we go into um, that journey, what is it, let's say, at the other side of it? I think from my perspective and experience, I think really working with, with grief helps you actually really un identify and understand what is really important and what the essence is there. Um, I remember going to a grief tending session, which Sophie and some colleagues ran. And I just had such clarity that I didn't even know was within me, but was there when you sort of strip everything else away. And I didn't expect that. And it was incredibly powerful. And, and I, I think to, to do that in a group context where you're working Talk towards something and realizing that there are differences, I think it can just sort of strip away some of the distractions actually about what's really there. But I feel like Sophie will have a more kind of, or uh, um, have other thoughts on that as well. But yeah, that's from my sort of personal experience. I mean, part of what I think, part of what we learn when we turn towards grief is that we can turn towards grief and. You know, I, this thing of do we do we turn towards life or do we turn towards death? But <clears throat> actually, they're really the same thing. If you know, if we're not including death and we're avoiding death, we're avoiding life. You know, and we have this image in grief work of you know the the wing of praise and the wing of grief, and this sense that if we don't fully allow our grief, we can't fully allow our praise, our joy. But also, if we don't fully allow ourselves to feel joy and beauty and what holds and supports us in life, we can't fully move towards our grief because there's not enough. And there can be a kind of fear that we'll get stuck in it and we'll never come back. So for me, these two things are completely the mirror of each other. And, and it's only in a culture where that's become unbalanced and that teaching's been lost, that profound understanding of what it is to be human has been lost, that we get this out of balance world. And 
you know, in, in healthy human culture, we I think about these archetypes, you know, one archetype is action, up, strength, outward, you know, movement. And the other is inward, digesting, softening, um, resting. And I think, you know, a lot of modern culture likes the first archetype and it and it avoids the second. And I think the, 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 this is my theory, isn't it? Is that underneath, the reason for that is if we're still and we turn towards vulnerability, we will find this sea of pain that has not been metabolized and we're terrified of it. And when we come to death or think about death or endings or separations, all of this pain potentially gets activated and and actually because we haven't spent time in that landscape you know learning how to meet all of these feelings not just of of sadness but of failure of shame of um, inadequacy of guilt all of these all of these difficult feelings um yeah then it's easy to to just try and stay away from them and you I want really to acknowledge, mm, yeah, go on. They can just really snowball. You can see how just layers and layers and a lifetime of unacknowledged pain that, yeah. you know, when there is something that you're forced to confront with, it is absolutely devastating because it crushes you because you get like a waterfall of all of those ones that haven't been met. So there, there's something about the the micro practice of acknowledging and seeing and witnessing and celebrating those micro endings and I think it's really, really important and for yourself and in our collectives as well. I think we can, if we can hold them there, then they're not going to be as crushing and devastating as they currently are. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I also just want to acknowledge, you know, that I think for different people in different positions, the, the practice of being with pain, enduring pain, metabolizing pain, supporting each other through pain is really different. And it's not evenly distributed, you know, in terms of who is dealing with the stress of poverty or the stress of abuse on a daily basis and learning to survive through that. You know, so this landscape is is very varied and and i'm aware that i tend to take it away from organizational you know because i'm working more with people's kind of personal situations and they're related and they're not the same um, but they play out i think you, you see it in these or sometimes the organizing places do create a container for some of that to fall out in in the conditions and then it's so much bigger than that original container was set up to be and, and the, the container itself can be overwhelmed by it too because either it has acknowledged or designed that in as well yeah and there can isn't it there can be all these feelings of uh, you know I remember when uh, I was doing a therapy training and our teacher got got sick got cancer and the, and this whole thing that she'd created um where she was running a therapy training not in a private institution that was affordable that was accessible to lots of people who couldn't do it any other way the feeling when she couldn't hold it anymore of failure and I was saying you know your success is all the people that have already walked through the doors and there's something isn't there about the thing is the organization and the entity but actually the success is the impact that's already had and there's something about how in modern culture we tend to see things rather than process and flow so that sense you know like composting makes that so clear doesn't it that the process of composting releases all the nutrients that are tied up in things that are dead and you know whose forms no longer contributing to life happening breaks it all down into a form where that life can go forward and there's something about how we see a network how we see it like can we see it not as the present moment structure but look there it is walking around and how that person's life was changed by it and then the ripples that are happening from that and if we if we look at networks and organizations like that does that make it easier to feel like wow what an amazing success this was you know given so much maybe it's you know maybe it's done it's 
it's lived a full and rich life rather than, oh, my God, this thing is going to end. And, and it's as if it's never been almost, you know, because yeah. of how, how we see. Yeah. Because ultimately, the relationships that are meaningful and fulfilling will continue sometimes a very long, long enriching life way beyond an organizational form. And it's, it's strange that we don't acknowledge that while there is so much truth in that. And uh, the, the, this is an organization rather than a network, although it had a large network, but the, the CDRA organization, they're a South African development organization that closed after 30 years. And they did an amazing job of kind of closing really intentionally and really seeding and spreading uh, the practice and the relationships actually throughout the world as part of their closing and they they hosted a sort of um, a two-week retreat for anyone over that 30 years for whom it had touched and felt called to come and celebrate and acknowledge and a huge amount of sort of creative um, explosion of, of writing and stories and experiences was gathered as part of that and then it took a whole year to run a series of events to celebrate and literally seed it throughout the world which is how I came to it and they were really talking about how and celebrating those relationships and even in the end they brokered new relationships and I'm telling this story to a new group of people now even though I only touched them right at the very end of that moment but the sort of the spirit and the relationships and the uh, the, the culture is now living on in a different way, which arguably is having much more impact than ever one organization in that particular country at that particular time had. So yeah, I think it's sort of reframing what we see as, as valuable. And, and yeah, the, if it's if a network and an experience that people have had is influencing people's lives and what they do next, that's incredibly powerful. Mm. Absolutely. Thank you. Like we're transitioning now into the composting. And my question to you would be, how do we do that? Are there steps, phases, uh, things we can orient ourselves toward to understand, okay, you know, this is a, let's say, potential journey we could embark on so that we actually get to spreading those nutrients. And... I think a really interesting question is about, you know, how do we how do we know when it's time? And I think I think that's, you know, just that kind of can we learn to sense that? And, you know, and often there is a tension, isn't it? And I've definitely met it in myself about the part of me that has now got an identity as being part of something, all of the relationships or the, you know, benefit that's come from that. And then you know, often I, I, I learned to recognize it in my football team. There are often signals that come that are saying, it's time for you to leave, Sophie, it's time for you to get out of the way. But I'm curious about that as an as an organization or a network and what, what people feel as they come in, isn't it? What are the signals? Is it a sense of stagnation, of tiredness, that there's not creative juice? You know, how, how do we sense? And then who feels they even have the authority to raise the question? Because it can feel like a betrayal. It can feel like an attack. You know, it can feel like it's somehow undermining the purpose of the organization. And I suspect you have to have quite a lot of either internal confidence or rank within the organization even to raise it. And how do we do that? Um, and then that question, how do we design a process, like you say, for the composting, for the all of the nutrients that are there to be spread? And, you know, Louise, that's a beautiful story. And, you know, maybe you have more of them. Yeah. And I think the, the sort of designing a good ending bit is almost the easy bit. There's some great stories and examples of how that's done. I think it's absolutely this. How do you open and ignite the conversation? A, a part of me is like, the, the question is when it's time should always be alive and on the table. Whenever you're exploring what next, there always needs to be an, an, a sort of normalizing that as a practice of exploration. But I think it is difficult in our networks, particularly when you're in this sort of social change space, because as you say, Sophie, it's so wrapped up in our own identities. And to, to and it feels like failure if, if you admit that this is the end, which of course it isn't. It just means that that purpose needs to be met in a different way, in a different form and in a different way of organizing, but it becomes a sort of very personal thing. So I think there's something about how, how do we get better at 
understanding and being in relationship with the different layers of our identities and that our kind of work professional identities or whatever this network is to us is one part of it and not the only part and not the only way we're going to manifest it so I think there's something about um, our own individual narratives and relationship to identities and knowing that they will change and layer and shift over time and yeah how do you how do you open that conversation up in a really creative way um, with groups of people as well and not making it a big deal like the bigger deal and the more we ignore it the bigger a thing it becomes but um, it's yeah when you get into it it's surprisingly juicy and creative or can be <laughs> Yeah, I guess the well, it's also having this conversation we're having here, or we will share many resources afterwards uh, with uh, folks here on the call, and knowing that you know it's like you're not alone. This is something that is is being done, and there are resources to support you, and go and have these conversations. Maybe that's already um, even like a colleague of mine. What does she say? She says the word like permission. Like, you know, we give ourselves permission to have those conversations and it's okay to have them. And people say, well, you know, no, not yet. Or why are you saying this? Or yeah, whatever that might um, spiral from, from the question. Um, yeah, I'll, I think I'll, I'll share an experience then afterwards during the fishbowl. But I wanted to ask you before we get to that stage, if there are any tools that we could use. I mean, for example, like this already is one, I think like, you know, bringing these in, into the conversation every now and then when we send something and just inviting others to engage with the conversation, maybe um, engaging in uh, grief tending conversations is also a practice that we can develop a little bit of muscle around that. But um, can you name any tools, examples, processes, uh, or develop on those so we can let's say have something uh, tangible as well i think from the stewarding loss website there's a, a number of different kind of toolkits and worksheets to work through as individuals or groups of people um you can kind of customize it but there's a whole bunch of uh yeah there's a whole there's a whole bunch of framing and guidance and ideas particularly that's designed for organizations but i think it will work for um, networks and communities as well it's quite transferable i don't have anything to, to add to that you know except that yeah with one organization where we were going through a process of restructuring, we weren't ending, but there was a possibility of endings for some people, you know, actually just to do an inquiry about endings mm -hmm. um, or loss or change, you know, I think it's really helpful if we're, this was an organization that was all about creating change, but we'd never really talked about, you know, where there'd been dramatic change in our own life. And it was one of those conversations where it felt like this carpet lifted up and suddenly we came into a much deeper sense of relationship about how change had been devastating for some of us, you know, and led to all kinds of, of challenges, but also it had led to growth. So in this, you know, there was a sort of tightness around, oh, my God, this, you know, a restructuring process, I might lose my hours. But when we look back at the effect of change in our lives or losses or endings in our lives, that sense of, oh, yes, and afterwards I was freed up and actually that whole new thing began. So it's like when we tell the stories of endings, we can we can find that. So it's good to tell not just the ending, but and then what happened, isn't it? That And that feeling that is, there's always a flow. The story always continues. Yeah. And, yeah, I think, that, you know, just framing uh, like a check-in question around endings and people's experience of endings and practicing that, noticing the small and big ones. With, if you're in a group, often there is often spaces to do that. So yeah, make, making that space, I think is a small step towards that, regardless of whether you're putting that on the table in a moment. I, I'm gonna add one piece because I do think that you know this thing in and it's and it's just very very different in different organizations but around how we make enough safety or enough um, sense that it's okay to go into places that feel vulnerable and tender with colleagues and where there may be 
hierarchy or you know other relationships um i just i just want to say we need to be careful with that and not just think like oh yeah we can do grief tending anywhere because i don't think we can i think we need to be really careful about the container that we make for people to bring things that feel very vulnerable so we're not re-traumatizing or something else so just a little bracket of care around that maybe connected to that I think there is something about framing as well and um I guess this is part of my kind of ongoing exploration and having done work with stewarding loss like for some people that really speaks to them but it's also very terrifying and people don't even want to go anywhere near it and endings is one and a transition is another thing and thresholds is it like there's lots of different ways to enter into this which can feel uh easy easier for different people and and in your context knowing what could be an unlock in a safe and appropriate way is absolutely right um and i think we're still collectively grappling with what with what that language and way of talking about some of this thing is because we haven't given it attention for a lot of time so i, I find myself talking across a whole spectrum of, of different words and roots in and seeing what actually shifts and opens for people yeah, thank you for the safety warning. That's always important that we don't jump into conversations that you cannot um, hold. Um, just wanted to ask you, uh, in our prep call, uh, you mentioned it's a topic you see coming up more and more. Uh, why do you think that is? And is it a specific type of organization? Um, uh... I'm not sure I'm seeing what I am seeing is more and more individual people who have an absolute uh, almost a calling or a commitment to, to doing this work and they're coming from all over the place which makes me feel very hopeful and I'm grappling with how and where to best apply it in their organizations, in their networks, as individuals kind of bringing other people together. But in the last year, I've just really noticing it feels like people are coming out from the woodwork. And I feel really excited about what that means and and where and how people are spreading it to. But Sophie, I don't know what you're seeing <laughs> or experiencing. I mean, I think grief is, is grief as a thing. It's more on the map, certainly since the pandemic, mental health, um, layers of what's happening for people that was absolutely there before but became more visible or became more acute with all of the disruption and the rupture of relationships that happened for many people during the pandemic. But I'm also just curious about the kind of wider landscape of the sense of the finiteness of globalised, you know, industrial techno culture and, and how much we can see that things cannot continue. And even whether people are facing into that or that sense of this whole big thing cannot carry on. So, you know, it's calling people to go, I need to be able to meet this and... <clears throat> whether that's meeting that in myself, in my work. And I do think there's a whole surfacing of things that have been avoided by mainstream culture or by the dominant culture that it's becoming more and more impossible to avoid as you know this modern capitalist, unsustainable way of life hits the buffers in more and more places. You know, it's already, the endings are already with us. Um, but not evenly distributed. Yeah, and the and the cracks and the voids are so vast, they just cannot be patched in the way they've been patched before. They're, yeah, they're, at a bigger scale, I do believe there is a repatterning at play. It can be difficult to believe that sometimes because the old systems fight back really strongly. But I, I think, but we are in process of whatever that is. And that that is meaning a lot of people are, both forced to or really choosing to lean into all of these things. Thank you. Thanks so much for opening these conversations, sharing some insights and experiences you've had.
during all these past years around this topic, I would like to invite everyone uh, here to participate in the discussion. I have, let's say, a few um, brief guiding questions for our fishbowl. What experiences can you share about composting or harvesting? What worked for you? What didn't? What, what have you seen? And also what touches you about this topic? Maybe you don't, don't have like a direct experience of having been involved in it, uh, but it's still uh, we all relate to this topic. So if you want to share how that is for you, uh, that's also very welcome. And how we're going to do this is that um, I will turn my camera off. I will invite for Louise and Sophie to hold on uh, for a little more moment. And we will, let's say, flow. Since I shut my camera off, there's room for one more person. You can come up, turn your camera on, share your experience, or you can even, let's say, ask a question and engage with our speakers or with someone else in the in the audience, and you start having um, a conversation. Let's say what we don't do is, you know, pop in, uh, say a question, and then leave again. That's not what we want to do. We want to uh, engage in a conversation, if possible. So, visual open. Let's see what happens. And then Louise and Sophie, as you see fit, you can also shut your camera off, leave. And if there's anything I didn't ask you that you think it's relevant to bring in, you can come in any other moment, just bring in that and then leave when feels good. Yeah, so let's see how we flow. So I'll shut off my camera and anyone is welcome to jump in. Ooh, I don't know who's going to arrive. It feels quite exciting. <laughs> yeah, thank you for holding it. I know it's not the... <laughs> going to hold the silence and the discomfort of that. And yeah, really welcome anyone to come in and join. It would be so great to hear other voices. Hi, Lena. Yeah, so I, I notice even even though I'm kind of partially holding the space, I'm still nervous to kind of show up in this format. Um, wow, I feel like there's so many things I could say. And I felt so moved at so many times, even during this like last half hour. Partially because I, it's almost like, okay, now it's getting very personal all of a sudden. So for me, death has been a huge part of my life already like from childhood and there's so much death yeah like in so many ways and it took me a really long time to learn how to be with death in a way that actually felt right you know like that felt um like where there was space for pain um and I guess this is why I can feel like in my body just how important this work is, no matter whether it's about death of a person or I really loved what you said in the very beginning, Louise, of we need to do this like micro practices, right? Because otherwise we will be swept away with all the things we bottled up um, until that one thing that really then brings it all up, right? So I, I really resonate with that. And something that I kind of struck me and this what I actually came in to share was two things I noticed that there are a lot of parallels to how I would want to do things with my collective or my organization into how I do my things in my romantic partnership and I thought there there are two things that I felt that were kind of bringing health health to the partnership that I would probably also bring health to organizations and it's first and I know you said it in some ways implicitly and explicitly but first is like making space for all things to be said and of course there are work environments where that's not the case and then probably you shouldn't but if we do have a culture that aims for that like how can we create almost like explicit agreements that we do make space for for all kinds of topics and for all kinds of emotions because I also noticed that in the moment where we have a shared agreement it's much easier to actually bring these things up because I know that, okay, one, there was a moment where we actually all said we are up for this, you know, no matter what it brings then up. Mm -hmm. And the other thing was to like almost make, to consider, like to ask this question, is this the end now on a relatively regular basis and not just assume 
that's something and in partnership it's I also feel like it adds a lot of health to not just assume we're, we're doing this now but to continue to to drop in that question and I feel like there's also a muscle that needs to be trained there where because it's scary right like it will bring up lots of emotions if something like something that matters to us ends and so how can we I feel like as the more we we invite ourselves to to be with that question on a more regular basis then it becomes less terrifying in a way oh yeah those were just things that came up for me and I wanted to share and I make some space for somebody else no inviting you to stay Lena (laughs) and let one of us go yeah let's hear different voices and move the conversation so I'm gonna leave and really welcoming someone else to come in is that okay and it's, it's funny, Lena, when you were, when you came in, um, I had a moment of like, oh, this is why, like networks and communities, it can be re- it can be really hard to to admit or to ask that this might be the end because we can experience so much community and belonging in these places, and the thought that they go. It's just heartbreaking because, you know, in some ways that was a bit of an answer of what was what was missing and some of what was talking about. And we, and we find it there and the thought that that could then go away and the fear that you might not ever have that again. Um, yeah, it's really difficult. It's really difficult. Mm. Hi, Ninian. Hello. Um, yeah, I, I, I just touched... Um, by a lot of this, actually, what you were saying, Lena, and what's been said before. And I guess what's around for me is the word and my struggle, but I think also others struggle with breakdown um, mm. sense. And what what does breakdown? Because at the end of the day, composting is breaking down. But for certainly me as a human, when I think of breakdown, I think of gosh, my mother breaking down, I think of, Mm. I don't know, breaking down of relationships or at the moment um, in some of my work, there are things that are not working, that, you know, there's a a breakdown. So there is that, um, yeah, kind of, oh, I gosh, find myself really shivering and (laughs) just that sense of what it is and how do I cope how do we cope? Um, how do we hold ourselves together? How do we support one another or an organization or a relationship when it's in breakdown? Um, so that that's really, really strong. I'm also going to just post in the chat because it does relate to this, but um, it's a centenary this year of a woman who's buried in the um, graveyard not far from here and came to stay here in Falkland for three different times in her life. Um, she was a woman who had kind of itchy feet and kept moving on. But she was helped by um, a guy called R.D. Lang and a psychotherapist called Joe Burke um, to go through breakdown, to literally, she went into Kingsley Hall where Gandhi stayed and he was in London and literally regressed and started shitting herself and painting with her shits. You know, it was radical therapy. Um, but through that, she she came through and became, um, yeah, an amazing artist and um, writer. And, um, you know, we're celebrating some of the stuff up here in Scotland this coming month, but there's a little bit of that's a person's story of coming through, coming through breakdown. And that wasn't really, it was sort of seen as anti-psychiatry movement and all of those things. And I think there were lots of things in it that I would still have struggles with, but I suppose it was just that little bit of what if we um, allowed and supported and accepted that breakdown is part of human or part of what organizations sometimes need to do. And I'm gonna break I was gonna say I'm gonna break down this three and go and then make space and see how it works. I, I would love to say something to that because it's almost like 
I mean, we're, I feel like we're all constantly told that breakdown is not an option or if you break down, then something is really wrong with you. And I think part of that is because like, again, we don't have spaces where we hold each other in our breakdowns because, you know, I can hold myself in so much, but there is a certain level of pain or struggle that I that I cannot hold on my own and that I cannot touch. And in order to touch, and what you said, we named it like coming through, in order to to meet that and come through, I need others. I need somebody to hold me. Yeah, I, I really do need that. And so I feel like if, if in order to collectively embrace this breaking down on a more like, as as part of life, we also need to embrace that then we hold each other in that to degree at least. Yeah. Um, yeah, that sounds sounds really healthy. Um, and hello, Trey. Um, I like just one other kind of thought as to what you were saying was, gosh, in terms of there's something around holding each other. There's also something around being held by um, a greater whole. Um, I don't know whether that's Mother Earth or whether it's um, the sky or God or, you know, whatever words you might use for it. There's something which I think is around that solidarity and support of each other in an organisation, but also of something that is greater than all of us. I'm also going to make more space. I love that remark, though. This is such a gorgeous conversation. So one of the questions was around what what works. And, uh, you know, while I don't profess to have answers, I, uh, I just do want to share a couple of things that we've been discovering. Um, I think there's a real distinction between environment, let's just call them environments. Let's not talk about organizations versus networks. Let's just call them environments where there's a lot of volunteers versus where there's employees, right? There's a very distinct sort of um, ethos that's different. Um, and in the environments that we've been playing in, it's been mostly volunteers like for 15, 20 years. So, um, one of the things that that we've been using is is this metaphor of laying eggs <laughs> how um how there seems to be this uh, uh valuing let's call it a valuing of lay the eggs <laughs> gestate the eggs hatch the eggs Feed the fled, you know, feed the fledglings, <laughs> teach them to fly, and then keep them flying at all costs. We can't let them, we can't let them die. <laughs> they have to stay alive at all costs. And and what we're missing is we're missing the building of the nest that happens before the eggs are even laid. And what is a building of a nest? Well, it's taking the bits and pieces and the composting of what was to weave the nest and to nurture the nest for the next set of eggs to lay, to, to, to come into the space. And, uh, and, and what I really valued about what's been shared today is this idea around conversation. It is a conversation. And I think we've sort of, what would be the, without laying blame, we've sort of defaulted, and I say the sort of the we as the proverbial we of humanity have defaulted to conversation as a opinion ping pong. <laughs> I have my opinion, you have your opinion, we're gonna ping pong back and forth. And instead of this cultivation of a conversation culture 
and seeing that conversation culture as that weaving of the nest. Um, that is a really beautiful experience that then encourages individuals, both personally and collectively, to sense into the environment, to sense into who am I playing with? How are we playing? Are we even playing? <laughs> are we even playing? And the sense making um, and sensing into the signals, being in the unknown for prolonged lengths of time, um, leaning into that, feeling into that so that and the other words that I really enjoyed was this idea of practice, right? Practicing being in what might be termed low stakes conversations, practicing flexing that muscle so that conversation is the weaving of the nest becomes just a way of being that undergirds the doing so that when the high stakes or what is perceived as higher stakes conversations emerge, that they can be met, that they can be seen, that they can be heard. And I'm just super, super grateful for this time. And, and I'm just really grateful. Thank you. And D, I'm going to pass the proverbial talking stick back to the center of the circle. Thank you so much. I, I wasn't going to say anything because it's all being said, right? Um, so clearly, and I'm thinking in my mind as people are talking and I'm taking things in, I'm like, I feel the richness and then I feel myself like over some, like I, I go to this like oversimplification I'm like you know like I feel almost like a child like I go well then this was must be the thing you know like right I go um I think like so I just in full transparency like my best friend of 25 years just recently passed this past Monday and so this conversation coming into endings and trying to hold what that means. And I've I've never had someone who I've been that close to, right, uh, pass. This is my first experience with this. So um all of the all of this conversation is really feeding into well, you know, what was my expectation? Right? Like what is my expectation around life, right? <laughs> and so I have a son also, you know, I talk about him a lot in the work that I do because he's been such an awesome teacher um, who has special needs. And, you know, one of the agreements that we have is that no expectations without agreement, no, no, no expectations without agreements. Like he is constantly having these kind of demonstrative, you didn't do this or I wanted that and it was not provided. And why is this thus, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Um, and I was like, I understand your expectation. However, I never agreed to that, <laughs> right? I never agreed to provide that. So I see the impasse and can we kind of renegotiate around your expectation? And Someone said to me one time about life, like none of us makes it out of here alive. Like it's like a gunfight in the OK Corral, <laughs> right? None of us make it out of this alive. So live your life accordingly. And I think that, you know, I wonder how we got so off, I guess, maybe with our expectations. Like, because life itself did not agree to that. And it expresses that in every single form with the changing of the seasons, with the changing you know, of our aging and our development. Life never agreed to the expectations. Um, you know what I mean? Does that, make, does that make sense? It's like, that's what's going on in my mind. And so I'm really often reconciling 
my expectations with the way life actually is and how it flows. And so once you start and like, how are we setting up then our children and the build the nest and understand the, you know what I mean? We give these wonderful Disney movie, Disney, Disney movies, right? <laughs> about, you know, the Lion King and the circle of life. And that's about all we get, right? That's about all we get. That's the totality of all the, you know, the human experience, Disney, the circle of life, you know, except for those people who plant and grow and take care of the earth and all of the, all of our friends who are doing that we tend to have more of a realistic perspective um, on that. So with that, I'll just say that was what I was holding as you were all talking and as I'm processing my own expectations, right? And I love the idea of the composting because we do compost. And, and one of the things I did say in the chat was that when you're not prepared for an experience or your expectations, even in starting a thing, like in, a, in an organization or in a network, when you don't have an expectation, when it happens, it feels violent. It feels jarring and, you know, like it, it can throw you off, I think. And I don't know if violence is the right word, but I know that my response is always like, what? You know, it's, it's always really jarring, but what was my expectation? And so, um. But when you have an awareness, it, you know, then, you know, it's about creating awareness, I guess, systemic awareness. I'm talking very individually right now, but I realize we're also talking about systems. So with that, I just want to say thank you uh, and welcome, Anna. <laughs> thank Anna. you. Thank you. That was so, um, it's been lovely to listen to like how this is weaved as a conversation. And I jumped in, um, Dee, when you were bringing our attention back again to this um, disassociation that's happened often in sort of our organisations, pulling us away from these very natural rhythms um, and these natural norms that we sort of have been living through as human beings for so long. And it really made me think about um, what I've been um pondering a lot this year which is about how do we um how do we start to bridge almost back into that place when we've um collectively kind of for organizations to be such disassociated mechanistic um almost sometimes like dead entities but not death in the natural way but dead in the removed um lifeless um if we look th more through say like that animist lens the idea of organizations being these living entities um i think it's an incredible way of um gaining entry a pathway into how do we then pull um our expectations of organizations back into something that's much more life aligned and much more systems aligned. And practically, um, one of the things, again, I'm thinking through it, how, what are even some of the small things that we might do in, in our collectives? Um, even things like the way that roles are described, even in strong self-organizing, communities often um give something a good death is not included in a role accountability um a, a role you know a strategy is often not how do we give our organization a good death or how do we give our projects a good death um even in the most kind of evolved self-organizing organizations where people are really looking for ways to evolve um so yeah, just sort of bouncing off what you said about, um, yeah, just some thoughts I've been having, some practical, even the small, it's like, how can we weave in the smallest ways that we can just start to normalize conversations around organizations as ecology, as living entities, as um, 
as alive systems and through that that just feels like it gives us such access to the language and frameworks of grieving death composting to become normal it's out of our control I just wanted to throw that out there, which you and you know, as we're in this circle, and I'm going to step out, but hey, Alicia, um, is out of our control. Like we're creating organizations that are within our control. So, you know, all the fledglings must fly with no matter and continue to fly and continue to fly because it's something that we want. We want the never mm -hmm. ending. So sometimes it's not just the expectations of death; it's what we want is to never never you know what I mean like never have that so um I cu I'm curious but I love the idea of we used to say at an organization that I was you know funders would ask what is our goal and we would say to not be needed anymore right and so that was what we would say to the funders and they just thought that was odd but it was like yeah so I just wanted to say that and I was going to step out as well thank y'all Thank you. Thank you all for contributing. You can, yeah, it was just, we can all turn our cameras back on just so that with this, we close our fishbowl and just to have a moment of reflection before we go, a little bit of digestion. Catherine, maybe you can guide us through that. Yeah, thanks. We, um, I mean, that was such a rich conversation and so many things came up probably within all of us. So we have an opportunity now to share with one another. We'll go into a breakout room and invite you to um, have the conversation that you want to have. But here's a prompt. What have you learned today and what's come up for you? And what is going to something that's going to change your shape for you when you're moving forward from this conversation? So enjoy your breakout. And it's um, the prompt is in the chat. Yes, we'll be just five minutes in breakouts. You will see the countdown. So I'll just open them now. Good. Welcome back, um, everyone. Uh, I know this was very short, but hopefully it helped a little bit of this uh, digesting, uh, integrating some of that. And um, yeah, actually, Catherine, we're going to be checking out. And uh, maybe before doing that, let's do just uh, sharing of resources, what we wanted to give you so that you can continue this inquiry. We have several links in the chat box. You have the upcoming Thriving Networks course uh, from which this conversation started. Also trauma courses and then also resources, both from human health Healthy, healthy human culture, and then from stewarding loss. So from uh, Sophie and Louise, respectively. <laughs> Loads of resources online. Go and use them. I think you can really um, get very insightful about all of this uh, with with these resources. And yeah, maybe I'll just um, yeah just hand it over to Catherine to close this conversation with us, and hopefully it's the first iteration and we can keep in touch and continue having these conversations through different channels and possibilities. So Catherine, over to you. Thank you. So as our kind of closing activity today, um, we'd like to do a chatter fall. So some of you may be familiar with the process. So let me just briefly say um, in the chat, um, I invite you to just put a phrase or a word or something that reflects what you're feeling today, but don't hit send. I'm going to give you just 30 seconds or so to write that into the chat. And then when um, people are ready, kind of put your hands up and then we'll hit send all at the same time. So it's a chatterfall. So here's your time to reflect. So Catherine, we share our takeaway or how we're feeling now in the chat, right? Yeah. Okay, ready? Let's go. Hit hit set return. Thank you. Pero que se enfríe tantito, doña Y lo voy a desmenuzar. 
Shelly. So we have provoked, longing for more, feeling like curling up by a fireplace, feeling like a tributary that is met a river. This is lovely. There's a lot of great thoughts here. Yes, we'll gather those and share them with you. You'll get an email with the recording and the contributions in the chat. I just wanted to thank um, Louise cool. and Sophie for being with us here today. Thank you so much for prompting this conversation and creating this space with us, sharing your wisdom. And thank you to my two co-hosts, Lena and Catherine, and to all of you for shaping this conversation. Wishing you all the very best. And hopefully we'll see you around. Thank you. Take care. Thanks so much. Bye all. And say goodbye. So. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.